Okay, hello everybody. Uh, hello everyone who might be watching this live and hello everybody who might be watching this later on the recording. This is uh, Self-Isolation Shakespeare. Uh, we're really excited to present uh, Hamlet today. Um, this uh, project uh, is really exciting for us. Uh, big thanks to Robert Scott Smith for making it happen. I'd also like to thank our team um, our team consists of myself, Jessica Graham, Liam Johnson, Lexi Thompson, and our illustrious stage manager, without whom none of this would be possible, Kirsten Farley. Um, we are a uh, student-led uh, collaborative group with the goal of presenting all of Shakespeare's canon on Zoom um, during the uh, lockdown that we're all currently experiencing. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to have the cast introduce themselves, um, tell you what characters they're playing and where they're broadcasting from. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Carvalho. I am broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah, and in the avenues, and I will be playing Hamlet. Hi, I'm Jessica Dudley Rodriguez. I am currently in Tallahassee, Florida, and I will be playing Polonius. Hi, I'm Sophie McConkie, and I am broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, and I will be playing Ophelia. Hi, I'm Ari Glosser, and I am in Hawaii, um, and I am Bernardo, player queen and a gentleman. Hello, my name is Napsugar Hegedish. I'm broadcasting from Las Vegas, Nevada, and I will be reading for Laertes. Hello, I'm Gabby Lemansky, and I am broadcasting from Sandy, Utah, and uh, I'll be playing Rosencrantz. Hi, I'm Jody Leibowitz, and I'm broadcasting from Saugerties, New York, and I'm playing Horatio. Hi, I'm Harper Pulsifer. I'm coming at you live from Portland, Oregon, um, and I will be playing Marcellus, first player, player king, and first clown. Hi, everyone. My name is Kalika Rose, and I'm in Chicago, and I am playing Queen Gertrude. Um, I'm Callie Scott. I'm in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I'll be playing the ghost, player Lucianus, and second clown. Happy quarantine, everybody. I am Brianne Taylor, and I will be playing Gildenstern. I am broadcasting from Park City, Utah. Hi, I'm Bailey Walker. I'll be playing Francisco, Cornelius Voltamond, Osric Prologue, and First Priest. I am broadcasting from Washington, DC. Hi everyone, I'm Laura. I am here in Traverse City, Michigan, coming at you live, and I will be reading as Claudius. Hi, I'm Danny. I will be um, broadcasting from Saratoga Springs, Utah, and I will be reading the stage directions. Okay, and this is Hamlet. Act one, scene one, Elsinore, a platform before the castle. Francisco at his post enters Bernardo. Who's there? Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo? I don't know. He? You come most carefully upon your hour. He has now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold, and I'm sick at heart. Have you had quiet, guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. Stand ho, who's there? Friends to this ground. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo has my place. Give you good night. Hola, Bernardo. Say, what, is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What, has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. 
Hmm. Horatio says, "'Tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story, what we have two nights seen. Well, let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven, where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one. Please break the off. Look now where it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Looks it not like the king. Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of Barry Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak! It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay, speak, speak! I charge thee, speak! He is gone and will not answer. Before my God, I might not disbelieve without the sensible and true avouch of mine own eyes. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with martial stock hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now, stand close and tell me, he that knows. Why, at this same strict and most observant watch, so nightly toils the subject of the land? And why such daily cast of brazen cannon, and foreign mart for implements of war? What might be toward that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint labor with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I, at least the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, dared to the combat, in which our valiant Hamlet did slay this Fortinbras, thus did forfeit with his life all those his lands. Now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes, but to recover of us those forsaid lands, so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations. The source of this our watch and the chief head of this post haste and rummage in the land. But soft, behold, lo, where it comes again. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily foreknowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast apported in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it, stay and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. Shall, shall I strike at it with my partisan? Do if it will not stand. Tis here. Tis here. Tis gone. We do it wrong, being so majestical to offer it the show of violence, for it is as the air invulnerable, and our vain blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. It faded on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever against that season comes, wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, the bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say, no spirit dares stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planets strike, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So gracious and so hallowed is the time. So have I heard and do in part believe it. But look, the morn in russet, russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Break we our watch up and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet, for, upon my life, this spirit, dumb to us, will speak to him. 
Scene two, a room of state in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, and Wolfma. Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we as twere with a defeated joy, with one auspicious and one dropping eye, with mirth and funeral and dirge and marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we here in Bard your better wisdoms, which we have taken all along, for all our thanks. Now, follows that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death that our state to be disjoint and out of frame. He hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands, lost by his father with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, that he suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, the full proportions are all made. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltamond, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway. In that in all things will we show our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. My dread lord, your leave and favor to return to France from whence though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yet now I must confess that duty done. My thoughts and wishes bend again towards France and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine and thy best graces. Spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son, my dear Hamlet, a little more than kin and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowst tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Ay, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, cold mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, together in all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. It is sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know that your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound for some term in filial obligation to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness, his unmanly grief. <laughs> we pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, 
You are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desires, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us, go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and fair reply. Be of ourself in Denmark. Madam, come, this gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. And grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, but the great cannon to the cloud shall tell, re-speaking earthly thunder. Come away. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie, aunt, ah, oh, fie, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this, but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So loving a king that was to this, Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think on't. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she. Oh, God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married with mine uncle? My father's brother. But no more like my father than I to Hercules, a little month. Ere yet, uh, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. I'm glad to see thee well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus, I'm very glad to see you. Good even, sir. But what, in faith, make you from Wittenberg? Will teach you to drink deep ere you depart? My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. Ugh, I pray thee, do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. My father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man, take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. 
saw. Who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear till I may deliver. Upon the witness of these gentlemen, this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch. In the dead, vast, and middle of the night been thus accountered. A figure like your father, armed at point exactly, Capope appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true, and we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight? We do, my lord. Armed, say you? Armed, my lord. From top to toe? My lord, from head to foot. Then not, saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. What looked he, frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I had been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer. 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 Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life, a sable silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance will walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it. Though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I will visit you. Our duty to Our your, duty honor. your honor. My father's spirit and arms? All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Oh, the night were come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Scene three, a room in Polonius's house. Enter Laertes and Ophelia. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume in suppliance of a minute, no more. No more but so? Think it no more. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor coddle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear his greatness weight. His will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, car for himself, for his choice depends on the safety and the health of this whole state, and therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, if it's your wisdom so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his sane deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes withal. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, if with too credent ear you list his songs, or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia, 
fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot of danger and desire. Be wary then, best safety lies in fear. Youth itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as a watchman to my heart. But my good brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven. Bows like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own weed. Oh, fear me not. <sighs> I stay too long, but here comes my father. <sighs> A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. There my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory see thou character. Those friends thou hast, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy. For the apparel oft proclaims the man, neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. Farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. What is, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself, half of your audience, but most free and bounteous. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? You speak like a green girl. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby, that you have taken these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly, or you'll tender me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in an honorable fashion. Aye. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Aye. I do know when the blood burns how Prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows these blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both. You must not take for fire. From this time, be somewhat scanter of your maiden presence. For Hamlet, believe so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you, come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Scene four, the platform. Enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. The air bites shrewdly, it is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. Then it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his want to walk. A flourish of trumpets. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering upswing reels. And as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and the trumpets thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Aye, Mary Ist. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. 
Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly inured hath oped its ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean, that thou, dead corpse, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What shall we do? It beckons you to go away with it. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why? What should be the fear? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord, or to the dreadful summit of the cliff, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprave your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled, you shall not go. <sighs> my fate cries out. Still I'm called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say away. Go on. I'll follow thee. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow. Scene five, another part of the platform, enter Ghost and Hamlet. Where wilt thou lead me? Speak, I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come, when I to sulphurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost. But pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to avenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day, confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I would a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh, list, if thou didst ever thy dear father love. Oh, God. Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder. Murder most foul is in the best it is, but this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation or thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. Oh, I find thee apt. Tis given out that, sleeping in my orchard, a serpent stung me. But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. Aye, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, won to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there, from me, whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sent the morning air, brief let me be. Sleeping within my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon, upon my secure hour thy uncle stole with juice of cursed hebanon in a vial, and in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distillment. Thus was I, sleeping by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched. 
Oh, horrible, oh, horrible, most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal blood of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. <laughs> Fare thee well at once. The glowworm shows the matin to be near and gins to pale his ineffectual fire. Adieu, adieu. Hamlet, remember me. Oh, oh, oh. oh you host of heaven. Oh, earth. What else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fie, fie. Hold, hold my heart. And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there. And thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven. Oh, most pernicious woman. Oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. My tables, meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word. It is adieu, adieu. Remember me? I have sworn it. My lord. My lord, my lord. My lord? Lord Hamlet. What news, my lord? Good, my lord, tell it. <sighs> There's ne'er an, a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an errant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. <sighs> Why, right, you are in the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, and for mine own poor part. Look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith heartily. There's no offense, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is Horatio, and much offense too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, or master as you may. And now, good friends, give me one poor request. What is, my lord, we will? Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Consent to swear. Uh, never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. He gets you big way. Then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard, swear by my sword. Well said, old mole. Canst work in the earth so fast? A worthy pioneer. Once more, remove good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here as before, never so help you mercy, how strange or odd soe'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such time seeing me never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing him some doubtful phrase, or such ambiguous givings out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do. So grace and mercy at your most need help you swear. Swear. Rest, rest, perturbed spirit!
so, gentlemen, let us go in together and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. It's two, scene one, a room in Polonius' house. Enter Polonius and Ophelia. How now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Oh, my lord, my lord, I have been so affrighted. With what in the name of God? My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded and downguided to his ankles, pale as a shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous in purport, as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, becomes before me. Mad for thy love. My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand, thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face as, as if he would draw it. Long stayed he so, and at last a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head, thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go. And with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes. For out o' doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. Come, this is the very <laughs> ecstasy of love, whose violent property fordoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings. I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his fetters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better heed in judgment, I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee, but beshrew my jealousy. Come, go we to the king. This must be known. Scene two, a room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so call it. What it should be more than his father's death that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both that being so young of days brought up with him, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our course some little time. So by your companies, to draw him on to pleasures and to gather so much as from the occasion you may glean. Whether aught to thus unknown afflicts him thus that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you. And sure I am, two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while, for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Uh, both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more to command than to entreaty. But we both obey and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my two changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. The ambassadors from Norway, my lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? I assure my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. 
and I do think that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that, that I do long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself, do grace them and bring them in. He tells me, my dear Gertrude, that he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubted him no other but the main, his father's death and our, our hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltmond, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. He sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polak. But, better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness, was falsely born in hand, sends out arrests on Fortinbras, receives rebuke from Norway, makes vow before his uncle nevermore to give the assay of arms against your majesty, whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him 3,000 crowns in annual fees and his commission to employ those soldiers. So I levied, as before, against the Polak with an entreaty herein further shown that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise on such regards of safety and allowance as therein are set down. It likes us well, and at a more considered time, we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, we thank you for your well-took labor. Go to your rest. At night, we'll feast together. Most welcome home. This business is well ended. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness, what is it to be nothing else but mad? But let that go. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity, and, and pity tis, tis true. A foolish figure, but fare it well, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then, and now remains, that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say the cause of this defect, for this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus. <laughs> I have a daughter, while she is mine, who in her duty and obedience, Mark, hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. <clears throat> to the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. That is an ill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear it thus. <laughs> In her excellent white bosom, these and- Give your hand to her. Good madam, stay a while. I will be faithful. <clears throat> doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. This in obedience hath my daughter shown me, and more above. But how hath she received his love? What do you think of me? As of a man, faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so. But what am I to think when I had seen this hot love on the wing? I went round to work. I precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, which done she took the fruits of my advice. And he repulsed a short tale to make fell into sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into, into the madness where now he raves and all we mourn for. Do you think tis this? Take this from this if this be otherwise. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does, indeed. 
at such time, I'll lose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind their Ross then, make the encounter, if he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon. Let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm on Carter's. We will try it. Oh, but look, we're sadly the poor wretch comes. Sweet Gertrude, leave us too. For we have closely sent for Hamlet hither that he, as were by accident, may hear affront Ophelia. Her father and I, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves, so that seen, unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge and gather by him as he has behaved, if it be the affliction of his love, or know that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. <laughs> so shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanted way again. To both your honors. Madam, I wish it may. Ophelia, walk you here. We will bestow ourselves. Read on this book. That show of an exercise may color your loneliness. We are oft to blame in this. Tis too much proved. Uh, with with devotion, devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Oh, is too true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience, the harlot's cheek beautied with plastering art. Is it not more ugly than the thing that helps it? Than is my deed to my most painted word? Oh, heavy burden. I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear? To grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to those that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus, the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia, nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. But my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, longed to re-deliver. 
I pray you now receive them. No, no. not I. I never gave you aught. I honored Lord. You know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed as did make the things more rich. Their perfume lost. Take these again. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? I truly, for the power of, honest, of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bod than the force of honesty can translate beauty to his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest. But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do, crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's thy father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery, go, farewell. Or, if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go. And quickly, too, farewell. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. I have heard of your paintings too well enough. God has given you one face, and you paint yourself another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp. You make, you nicknames God's creatures. You make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll know more on it. It has made me mad. I say, we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery, go. Oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, did suck the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh. That unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me. Who will see what I have seen. See what I see. Love, his affections do not that way ten, nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There is something in his soul which 
or melancholy sits on brood, and I do doubt the hatch and disclose will be some danger. How oh, now, Ophelia, you need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. Away, I do beseech you. Here he comes. I'll board him presently. How does my good Lord Hamlet? Mm, well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Mm, excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Mm, then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord. I, sir. To be honest, as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of 10,000. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun breeds batten maggots and a dead dog, being a god-kissing carrion. Have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. How say you by that, still harping on my daughter? Yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. Speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. <gasps> the matter, my lord. Between who? I, I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir. For the satirical rogue says here, that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, altogether with most weak hams. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, though I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down, for yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if, like a crab, you could go backward? Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed, that is out of the air. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. My honorable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. You go to seek the Lord Hamlet, there he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord. My, my most dear lord. Uh, my excellent good friends. <laughs> How do you both? Good lad. Oh, Guildenstern. <laughs> Rosencrantz. Good lads. How do you both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Hmm, nor the soles of her shoe? Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist, or in the middle of her favors? Faith, her privates, we. In the secret parts of fortune. <laughs> Almost true, she is a strumpet. What's the news? Uh, none, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. Ugh, then is doomsday near. <clears throat> but your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord. Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons, <laughs> Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams? Shall we to the court? 
we'll, we'll wait upon you. you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. In the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. You were sent for, and there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, be even and direct with me whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen molds no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air. Why, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it seems, it appears to me no other thing than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, nor woman neither, but by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when you I said man delights not me? To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what Lenten entertainment the player shall receive from you, and hither they are coming to offer you service. What players are they? There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then. My uncle, father, and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north, northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Hmm. Well, be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players. Mark it. Um, my lord, I have news to tell you. The actors have come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon mine honor. The best actors, the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical, historical pastoral, scenes indivisible. In Dividable or poem unlimited. You are welcome, masters. Welcome all. I'm glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but, but it was never acted, or if it was not above once. For the play I remember, Please Not the Million, was caviar to the general. <gasps> Anon he finds him, striking too short at Greeks, his antique sword, 
rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched Pyrrhus drives at Priram. Enrage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then, senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming tops, stoops to his base, and with hideous crash, takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a man neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below as hush as death. Anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus' pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars' armor forged for proof a turn with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. This is too long. It shall to the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on. He is for a jig or a tale of Baudry, or he sleeps. Say on. Come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the mobbled queen? The mobbled queen. That's good. M mobbled queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison room. A clout upon that head where late a diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and oared timid loins, a blanket. In the alarm of fear, caught up, who this had seen, with tongue in venom steeped, gainst fortune's state would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing his sword with her husband's limbs. The instant burst of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Look whether he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes. Pray you no more. Oh, tis well. I'll have thee speak out the rest soon. Good my lords, good my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the age. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. Uh, dost thou hear me, old friend? Uh, yes. Ah, there you are. Can you, um, can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, my lord. We'll have it tomorrow, for tomorrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert into it, could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord and look you mock him not. <laughs> My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Aye, so God be with you. <sighs> now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage waned, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting to forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, 
for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage in tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty, appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy, meddled rascal peak, like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing, no, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across? plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, gives me, tweaks me by the nose, gives me a lie in the throat as deepest to the lungs. Who does me this? <sighs> Swoons. I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fatted all the region's kites with that slave's awful, bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Go, fie on it, foe. <sighs> About my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting in a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks, I'll tent him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and th the devil hath the power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my melancholy and my weakness, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. We'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Intermission. Three, scene one, a room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. <laughs> and can you, by no trip of circumstance, get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps aloof when we would bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did he receive you well? Most like a gentleman. But with much 
forcing of his disposition. Negative question, but of our demands, most free in his reply. Did you assay him to any pastime? Madam, it so fell out that certain players we o'er wrought on the way, of these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They are about the court, and, as I think, have already an order this night to play before him. It is most true, and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. With all my heart, and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge, and drive his purpose onto these delights. We shall, my lord. I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. Well, happily the seas and countries different with variable object, objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart whereon his brain still beating puts him thus from the fashion of himself. What think you on it? It shall do well. But yet do I believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. My lord, do as you please. But if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him, and I'll be placed, so please you, in the ear of all their conference. If she find him not, to England send him, or can find him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. Scene two, a hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and Horatio. What ho, Horatio? Here, sweet lord, at your service. <sighs> Horatio, thou art even as just a man as e'er my conversation coped with all. Oh, my dear lord. Nay, do not think I flatter. <laughs> Something too much of this. There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I told thee of my father's death. Observe mine uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen. Get you a place. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. How fair is our cousin Hamlet? Excellent in faith. I eat the air, promise grand. I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. Uh, my lord, you played once in the university, you say? That I did, my lord, and was accounted a good actor. What did you enact? I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. Oh, Twas. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital calf there. Come hither, my dear Hamlet, sit by me. No, good mother, here's metal more attractive. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, my head upon your lap? Aye, my lord. Do you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What is, my lord? Nothing. You are merry, my lord. Who, I? I, my lord. <gasps> oh, God! What should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within these two hours. Nay, tis, tis twice two months, my lord. So long? <sighs> Nay, then, let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens! Die two months ago, and not forgotten yet? Enter Prolock. For us, and for our tragedy, here stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. Enter two players, king and queen. Full thirty times have passed in sacred bonds. 
so many journeys, may the sun and moon make us again count or a love be done. Faith, I must leave thee, love, and shortly too. My optimum powers their functions leave to do. And thou shalt live in this fair world behind, honored, beloved, and happily one as kind. For husband shalt thou take out the rest. Such love must needs be treason in my breast. In second husband, let me be accursed. None wed the second, but who killed the first. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think now what you speak, but what we do determine oft we break. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to me give food, nor heaven light. Sport and repose lock from me day and night. To desperation, desperation turn my trust and hope. Both here and hence pursue me lasting strife. If once a widow, ever I be wife. She should break it now. <sighs> Tis deeply sworn. Sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile the tedious day with sleep. Sleep, rock thy brain, and never come mischance between us twain. Madam, how like you this play? Mm. Methinks the lady doth protest too much. Oh, but she'll keep her word. What do you call the play? The Mouse Trap. Enter Lucanius. Thoughts black, hands apt, drugs fit, and time agreeing. Confederate season, else no creature seeing. Thou mixture rank of midnight weeds collected, with Hecate's band thrice blasted, thrice infected. Thy natural magic and dire property usurp on life immediately. <laughs> Pours poison into the sleeper's ear. He poisons him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and rich in choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The king rises. What, frighted with false fire? How fares my lord? Give o'er the play. Lights, lights, give me lights. Lights, lights, lights. Excellent all but Hamlet and Horatio. Oh, good Horatio, I'll take the word, ghost's word for a thousand pounds. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning? I did very well note him. Come, some music, come the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then be like he likes it not pretty. Good, my lord, vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. I, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvelous distempered. With drink, sir? No, my lord, rather with choler. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit. She desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. We shall obey. Were she ten times our mother? Have you any further trade with us? My lord, you once did love me. So I do still by these pickers and stealers. Re-enter the players with recorders. <gasps> oh! The recorders! Let me see one. To withdraw with you. Why do you go about to recover the wind of me, as if you would drive me into a toil? Oh, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. Tis as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your voice. 
and it will discourse most eloquent music. I know no touch of it, my lord. Why, look you now. How unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would sound me from my lowest note at the top of my compass. Splud, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me. You cannot play upon me. God bless you, sir. My lord, the queen would speak with you and presently. Do you see yonder cloud that's in the shape of a camel? By the mass, and tis like a camel indeed. Methinks tis like a weasel. It's backed like a weasel. Or like a whale? Very like a whale. Then I will come to my mother by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Leave me, friends. Tis now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft. Now to my mother. I will speak daggers to her but use none. Scene three, a room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. I like him not, nor stands it safe with us to let his madness rage. Therefore, prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he shall to England along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so dangerous as doth hourly grow out of his lunacies. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent, and, and like a man to do double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall both begin and neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Oh, where to serves mercy but, but to confront the visage of offense? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall or pardon being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my, me my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be since I'm still possessed of the effects for which I did the murder, my, my crown, my own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense? In the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice and off to seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature. And we ourselves compelled, even to the teeth and forehead of our faults, to give in evidence. What then? What rests? <sighs> Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet. 
What can it when one can not repent? Oh, wretched state, oh, bosom black as death, oh, blinded soul that art struggling to be free. Ugh. Help, angels, make a say. <sighs> Bow, stubborn knees, and heart with strings of steel be soft as the sinews of a newborn babe. All may be well. Retires and kneels. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is praying. And now I'll do it, and so, so he goes to heaven, and so I am revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that, I, his sole son, do that same villain send to heaven? Oh, this is hire and salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes brought blood, bro broad blown as flush as may, and how his audit stands, who knows save heaven? Am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No, up sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, a gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it. Then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell. Whereto it goes, my mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Scene for the Queen's Closet. Enter Queen Gertrude and Polonius. He will come straight. Look you lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with and that your grace hath screened and stood between much heat in him. Ostance me even here. Pray you, be round with him. Mother! Mother! I'll warrant you. Mother! Fear me not, withdraw, I hear him coming. Polonius hides behind the areas. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rood, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then. I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come, I will sit you down. You shall not budge till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou will not mur murder me. Help, help, help! What ho, help, help, help! How now, a rat? Death for a duck and death! Fills Polonius through the eras. Oh, me! What hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this? A bloody deed? Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Aye, lady, twas my word. Lifts up array and discovers Polonius. 
Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better, take thy fortune. Leave the wringing of your hands, peace! Sit you down, and let me wring your heart, for so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff. What have I done, that thou, wear, that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, makes marriage vows as false as dicer's oaths. I me, mean, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? With you. On this picture, and on this, the counterfeit, pre counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See? What a grace was seated on this brow. A combination and a form indeed, where every god did seem to set his seal, to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now, what follows? Here is your husband like a mildewed ear, blasting your wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you, on this fair mountain, leave to feed and batten on this moor? Have you eyes? You cannot call it love. For your age, the heyday and the blood is tame. It's humble. It waits upon judgment. And what judgment would step from this to this? Eyes without feeling, feeling without sight, Ears without hands or eyes, smelling sands all, or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope. Oh, shame! Where is thy blush? Oh, Hamlet, speak no more. That turns mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tink. Nay, but to live. In the rank sweat of an enseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak no more to me! These words like daggers enter in my ears, no more speak, Hamlet. A murderer and a villain! A king of shreds and patches! <gasps> Save me, and hover over me with, to your wings, you heavenly guards. What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do you not come your tardy son to chide that lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command? Oh, say. Do not forget. This visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose. But look, amazement on thy mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Speak to her, Hamlet! How is't with you, lady? Alas, how is't with you? That you do bend your eye on vacancy, whereon do you look? On him, on him! Look, you how, how pale he glares. Do not look upon me. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing all, yet all that is I see. Do you nothing here? Nothing, nothing but ourselves. Why, look you there. Look how it steals away my, my father in his habit as he lived. Look where he goes, even now, out of the portal. <laughs> This is the very, very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation, ecstasy, is very cunning in. Ecstasy! <laughs> My pulse, as yours, doth temperately keep time and makes us healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered, Mother. For love of grace, lay not that uttering, mattering unction to your soul that not your trespass, but my madness speaks. Confess yourself to heaven. Repent what's past. 
Avoid what is to come, and do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them rancor. Oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Oh, throw away the worser part of it, and live the better with the, the purer with the other half. Good night, but go not to mine uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. For this same lord, I do repent, but heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me. So, again, good night. I must be cruel only to be kind. What shall I do? Not this, by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed. Or let him for a pair of reaching kisses make you to ravel all this matter out that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England. You know that? Lack. I had forgot it is so concluded on. There are, there's letters sealed. And my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. I lug the guts into the neighbor's room. Mother, good night. Indeed, this Counselor is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish prating knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. Excellent. Hamlet dragging in Polonius. Act four, scene one, enter king. There's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate them, tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Oh, my good lord, what I've seen tonight. What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Oh, mad is the sea and wind when both contend which is the mightier. In his lawless fit behind the arras, hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries, a rat, a rat, and in this brandish apprehension, kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed. It had been so with us had we been there. His liberty is full of threats to all, to to you, yourself, to us, to everyone. Alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? It will be laid to us whose providence should have kept short, restraint and out of haunt this mad young man, but, but so much was our love, we would not understand to see what was most fit, but like the owner of a foul disease to keep it from divulging, let it feed even on the pith of life. Where is he gone? To draw apart the body he hath killed, or whom his madness, oh, he weeps for what is done. Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship him hence, and this vile deed we must with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. Ho, Gildenstern. Friends, both, go join you with some further aid. Hamlet in madness hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go, seek him out, speak fair, and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you haste in this. Come. 
Gertrude will call upon our wisest friends and let them know both what we mean to do and what's untimely done. Oh, come away. My soul is full of discord and dismay. Or scene two, another room in the castle, enter Hamlet. Safely stowed. Hamlet. Hamlet. Lord Hamlet. Lord Hamlet. What noise? Who calls on Hamlet? Oh. What have you done with the, come. What have you done, my lord? Uh, with the dead body. Compounded it with dust whereto tis kin. Tell us where tis that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord. I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities, but such officers do the king best service in the end. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but squeezing you, and sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I'm glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord. Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hide, fox, and I'll after. Scene three, another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius. I have sent to seek him and to find the body. How dangerous is it that this man goes loose? Yet, must not we put strong law on him? He's loved of the distracted multitude who like not in their judgment, but their eyes. And where to so the, offender, the offender's scourge is weighed, but never the offense. To bear all smooth and even the sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved or not at all. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are eating at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us and we fat ourselves for maggots alas alas a man may fish with a worm that hath eat of a king and cat of the fish that had fed on that worm what does you mean by this nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar where is polonius in heaven send hither to see if your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. But indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go, seek him there. He will stay till you come. <laughs> Hamlet, this deed for thine especial safety, which we do tender as we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore, prepare thyself. The bark is ready, the wind at help, and the associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England! Ay, Hamlet. Good. So is it if thou knewest our purposes. I see a cherub that sees them. But come, for England! Farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh, so my mother. Come, for England. 
follow him at foot, tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not, I'll have him hence tonight. Away! Oh, for everything is sealed and done, the elf leans on the affair, affair. I pray you, make haste. And England, if my love thou holdst at aught, thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign process, which imports at full by letters congruing to that effect, the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England. For like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me till I know tis done. How are my haps, my joys, never begun? Scene five, Elsinore, a room in the castle. Enter Queen Gertrude and gentlewoman. I will not speak with her. She is importunate, indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks in the world. Speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. Let her come in. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? How now, Ophelia? <clears throat> How should I your true love know? From the other one, by his cockle hat and staff, and his sandal shoon. Alas, we <laughs> don't get in towards this song. Say you? Nay, <laughs> pray you, Mark. He is dead and gone, lady. He is dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf, and at his heels a stone. Nay, but Ophelia. Pray you mark! White his shroud as the mountain close, guarded with sweet flowers. He be wet to the grave that goes with true love showers. How do you, pretty lady? Well, God help you. They say. And the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but not what we may become. May God be at your table. Conceit upon her father. Pray you, let's have no words of this, but when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning be time, and I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and up the chamber door, let in the maid and out the maid, never departed more. How long has she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep to think that they would bury him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. <clears throat> Come on, my coach. <clears throat> good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. Oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude. Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions. First her father slain, next your son gone, and he the most violent author of his own, just remove. The people muddied, thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius' death, and we have done but greenly in the hugger-mugger to inter him. 
poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment, without which we are pictures or mere beasts. And last, and as much of containing all of these, her brother is in secret come from France, and wants not buzzers in his ears to infect him with pestilent speeches of his father's death. Oh! What is the matter? What is this? Save yourself, my lord, Laertes, in a riotous head, o'erbears your officers. The rabble call him lord. They cry, choose we, Laertes is king. Claps, hands, tongues, applaud it to the clouds. Laertes shall be king, Laertes king. How cheerfully on the false trail they cry. Oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs. Noise, the door are broke. Oh, thou vile king, where is my father? Calmly, good Laertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me a bastard. Let it go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed. Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell, allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, I dare damnation. Only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Good, Laertes. I am guiltless of your father's death and and most sensible in grief for it. It shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Now, what noise is that? Oh, heat, dry up my brains. Tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. Dear maid, kind sister, Sweet Ophelia, oh heavens, is possible. They bore him barefaced on the bier. Hey nani, hey nani, hey nani. And in his grave many Are you well, my dove? Hadst thou thy wits and did persuade revenge, it could not move thus. There's Rosemary. That's for remembrance. Pray, love, remember. His pansies, that's for thought. Is real? For you. And some for me. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. Oh, end affliction, passion, hell itself. She turns a favor into prettiness. And will he not come again? And will he not come again? No, no, he is dead. Go to thy deathbed. He never will come again. God be with ye. 
do you see this? Oh, God! Laertes, I, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. We will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we call ours to you in satisfaction. Be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. And where the offense is, let the great axe fall. Scene seven, another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius and Laertes. Laertes. Was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why do you ask this? <sighs> Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed, more than words? To cut his throat in the church. Revenge should have no bounds. But good, Laertes, Hamlet returned shall know you are come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not pursue these foils, so that with ease or with a little shuffling, you may requite him for your father. I will do it, and for that purpose, I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank so mortal that no cataplasm so rare can save the thing from death that is but scratched with all. I'll touch my point with this contagion that if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Hmm. Let's further think on this. If this should fail, and that our drift look through our bad performance, t'or better not essay, therefore, this project should have a back or a second. When in motion, you are hot and dry, and he calls for drink, there, I'll have prepared for him a chalice for the knots, whereon but sipping our purpose may hold there. How now, sweet queen? One woe doth tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. Your sisters drowned Laertes. Drowned? Oh, where? There is a willow that grows aslant a brook that shows his whole leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds clamoring to hang. An envious liver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes and as one incapable of her own distress for like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments heavy with their drink, pulled the poor, poor wretch from her melodious late to muddy death. Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia. And therefore, I forbid my tears. 
I have a speech of fire that fain would blaze, but that this folly doubts it! Let's follow, Gertrude. How much I had to do to calm his rage. Now I feel that this will give it start again. I've seen one, a churchyard. Enter two clowns. <clears throat> Is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell thee she is, and therefore make her grave straight. <laughs> Happy. Unless she drowned herself in her own defense. But right, just found so. It must be, say often dendo. It cannot be else, for here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act, and an act have three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Ergal, she drowned herself wittingly. Uh, nay, but hear you, good man Delver. What God, about give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is, will he, nil he, he goes. Mark you that. But if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Ergal, he is not guilty of his own death and shortens not his own life. Cudgel thy brains no more about it. Enter Hamlet and Horatio at a distance. Go get the inn. First clown digs and sings. Oh, in youth when I did love, did love, methought it was very sweet to contract all oh, the time for uh, my be behove it. Oh, methought there was nothing neat. Does this fellow know feeling of his business that he sings at grave-making? Custom hath yeah. made it in him a property of easiness. But age, with his stealing steps, hath clawed me in his clutch, and hath shipped me until the land, as if it had never been such. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. Oh, the knave jowls it to the ground as, as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. It might, my lord. There's another. I will speak to this fellow. Whose grave's this, Sirrah? Mine, sir. What man dost thou dig it for? Uh, for no man, sir. What woman, then? <laughs> for none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? Well, there was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute this name is. How long has thou been a, a grave maker? Ah, for all the days of the year. I came to it that day our King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? <laughs> Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the day young Hamlet was born. He that is mad and sent to England. I marry. Uh, why was he sent into England? Well, because he's mad. He shall recover his wits. There, or... If he do not, it is, it is no great matter there. Why? Uh, there, the men are as mad as he. <laughs> How came he mad? Oh, very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith, even with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in... Denmark. There's a skull now. This skull has lain in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? Mm. A horse and a mad fellow's it was. This same skull, it was Yorick, the king's jester. This? Even that? Uh, let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. 
I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back I, a thousand times. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set a, a table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning? Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let it paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. But soft, but soft, aside. Here comes the king. Enter priest. In procession, the corpse of Ophelia, Laertes, and mourners following. King, Queen Gertrude. The queen, the courtiers? Who is this they follow? And with such maimed rites that doth betoken the course they followed, did with desperate hand for its life. Twas of some estate. Couch we a while and mark. Retiring with Horatia. What ceremony else? Her death was doubtful. And but that great command or sways the order, she should in ground unsanctified have lodged till the last trumpet. Must there be no more done? No more be done. I'll lay her in the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring. What? The fair Ophelia! Sweets to the sweet, farewell. I hoped thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked sweet maid, not have strewed thy grave. Oh, trouble, woe, fall ten times trouble on that cursed head whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. To hold off the earth a while till I have caught her in my arms once more. Whose grief is this that bears such an emphasis? The devil take thy soul! Hamlet, Hamlet! I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. What will thou do for her? Oh, he is mad, Laertes. The love of God forbear him. Swoons, show me what thou wilt do. Wilt weep, wilt fight, wilt fast, wilt tear thyself, I'll do it. Dost thou come here to whine? I'll rant as well as thou. This is mere madness. Hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever. But it is no matter. Let Hercules do what he may. The cat will mew, and dog will have his day. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. Scene two, a hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and Horatio. Why, what a king is this? Does it not, thinkest thee, stand me now upon? He hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage. Is not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm? I am very sorry, good Horatio, that to Laertes I forgot myself. For by the image of my cause, I see the portraiture of his. I'll court his favors. But sure, the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. Peace not, 
Who comes here? Your lordship is right. Welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Dost thou know this water fly? No, my good lord. I my lord. More gracious. My lord, his majesty bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. Sir, this is the matter. Sir, here is newly come to court Laertes. Believe me, an absolute gentleman, full of the most excellent differences, a very soft society and great showing. You shall find in him the continent of a gentleman. What imports the nomination of this gentleman? Of Laertes. Of him, sir? I know you are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I dare not confess that, lest I should compare with him in excellence. But to know a man well were to know himself. I mean, sir, for his weapon. But in the imputation laid on by them, in his need, he's unfellowed. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath wagered with him that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. How if I answer no? I mean, my lord, the opposition of your person in trial. Sir, I will walk here in the hall, if it please his majesty. Tis the breathing time of day with me. I will win hit for him if I can. If not, I will gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. I commend my duty to your lordship. Yours, yours. You will lose this wager, my lord. I do not think so. But thou wouldst not know how ills all here about my heart. But it is no matter. Nay, good, my lord. It is but foolery. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. Not a whit. We defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Enter King, Queen, Laertes, and Osric. Come. Hamlet, come, take this hand from me. King Claudius put Laertes' hand into Hamlet's. Give me your pardon, sir. I've done you wrong, this presence knows. And you must needs have heard how I am punished with sore distraction. What I have done, I here proclaim, was madness. Sir, in this audience, free me so far in your most generous thoughts. I am satisfied. I do receive your offered love like love and will not wrong it. I embrace it freely and will this brother's wager frank frankly play. Give us the foils. Come, come on. Come, one for me. Give them the foils, young Osric. Hi, my good lord. Set me the scoops of wine upon the table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, the king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath, and in the cup in union shall he throw richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Come, begin. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. They play. One. No! Judgment! A hit, a very palpable hit. Well, again. Stay, uh, give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Give him the cup. I'll play this bout first, set it by a while. Come. Take play. Another hit, what say you? A touch, a touch, I do confess. Our son shall win. He scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Good madam. Gertrude, do not drink. Nay. I will, my lord, I pray you, pardon me. 
It is the poison cup. It is too late. I dare not drink yet, madam. By and by. Well, come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. I do not think it. Yet tis almost against my conscience. Come, for a third, Laertes, you but dally. <sighs> Say you so. Come on. They play. Nothing. Neither way. Have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet, then in scuffling, they change rapiers, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. Part them, they are incensed. Nay, come again. Queen Gertrude falls. <sighs> Look to the queen there, ho! They bleed on both sides. How is it, my lord? Uh, how is Laertes? Oh, I am justly killed by mine own treachery. How does the queen? She, she swoons to see them bleed. No, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I'm poisoned. Gertrude dies. Oh, villainy, treachery, seek it out. It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king, the, the king's to blame. Hamlet stabs King Claudius. <sighs> oh, yet yeah, defend me, friends. I am but hurt. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned to Dane, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. King Claudius dies. He is justly served. It is the poison tempered by himself. But exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet, mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Heaven make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. Ah, uh, you that look pale and tremble at this chance that are but mutes or audience to this act had I but time mm, I could tell you but let it be Horatio I am dead thou livest report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied? Oh, good Horatio, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. The rest is silence. Hamlet dies. End of play.